الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأزكي التسليم أما بعد يقول الله جل وعلا إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغيروا ما بأنفسهم The brothers and sisters I think the topic is that broad and it needs many lectures as we talk about the old generations who have contributed immensely to the change of this world. If you just have a glance at the word change and what it means, change is that word which when you pronounce it, it doesn't take you that much to pronounce it, but it contains a very deep, deep meaning in a sense that it entails the whole life. It is the reflection of the life. It is the, it is the interpretation of the life. It is sunnah or sunnah Allah al-kawniya. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the previous Quranic verse which we have previously recited at the outset in Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the nations unless otherwise they are willing to change or they change in both different meanings according to the different invitations by the scholars it is something that has been relegated to us do we want to change then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us and assist us in bringing about a change in our life. So when we understand the word change, that it does have that deep meaning, then only can we understand that those who have changed the world have not changed like that way, but through channels, through factories, through means, through wasail and asalib. If I take you back to the time of the Prophet وسلم, and the immediate communities to him, those of the predecessors, the Salaf al Salih, we understand that the Prophet وسلم, educated the Muslims on these principles. He educated them on bring about a change. But the change that is needed here before we take a step towards any other thing is that which comes from within ourselves. Let me change myself first before I talk about other people. Let it be realized on the individual level before we go to society. Let us realize it within our families before we go to the rest of the world. Let me change inwardly before I talk about outward. That is why in the Meccan period, not less than 13 years, the revelation that has that had been coming down on the Prophet وسلم, constantly was just focusing on that spatial aspect, which was the change that comes from when from inside. They were taught to establish the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their hearts. They were taught to get rid of any kind of let us say sinfulness. They were taught to get rid of whatever that is bad. They were educated in that way before any other thing could come. There was no any constitution at all. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not yet built the Islamic State. They have not yet immigrated to Medina and Nawara. No ahkam, no rules, no governings were found in the Holy Quran. All that which is being focused, all that that was being focused on was change yourself. So when you transfer, when you transform yourself, when you move from that bad level, from that bad situation, from that bad atmosphere, only then you can move to the rest of the world that you can change. That is where we find the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who were very close to the Prophet وسلم, who lived in that period of time before the advent of Islam, they knew nothing about any religion. That is why 
if you have a glance at the Western history, they label them as barbarian as a savage. They were quite far from any civilization at all. But when is Islam came, when is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down that revelation upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When they received the message, they have changed 180 degrees. They were not the people that were labeled as savages and barbarians. They are no more of that but they, because they understood what Islam is. That's why the Prophet وسلم, said the real mu'min is that which carries the real iman in his heart. Whenever you understand that iman and put it into your heart, then you can understand how that iman tests, or you can feel how it tests. That is how the Prophet وسلم, educated his companions. So, Sahaba were not in an ordinary group of people. They were an extraordinary group of people, individual as well as collective. I mean, uh, stories of, of, of the companions uh, uh, can be found in many different books. Their perseverance, their hardship, their sacrifice, their steadfastness, their iman. After they understood all these things, then they came to the rest of the world to change. Here, we are embarking on a new stage which is carrying the message of Islam to the people. Here comes Musab, here comes Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, here comes Abdullah bin Mas'ud. In a time when no one was allowed to say a word in the world of Quraysh, in a time Islam was being fought in a way that you couldn't imagine, in a time no one was allowed to utter a word, here comes Abdullah bin Mas'ud and says, I have to do something for Islam. And he shouts and proclaims as, as, you know, as, as loud as he could in a place where Quraysh people used to gather. And he says the word, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, which is something which they have never heard. It. They have never heard of it. It was Hebrew to them. Then they did not leave him go, but they beat him up. The same applies to the case of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari when he came to Makkah al-Mukarram and he said, Oh Prophet, I want to join the community of faith. And the Prophet وسلم, says, said to him, Abu Dhar, Islam is still catching at his teeth. It does not yet flourish as, as it needs you know, to be. So I would suggest to you if you go back to Al-Ghafar because you don't have many people here. You don't have a strong tribe here in Mecca, in Mecca al-Mukarramah. You are from Al-Ghafar. Get back to the place where you came from. So whenever you hear that Islam gets stronger and stronger, then you can join the train. But now it's not time for you to be with us. But Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, who to an extent became content with the suggestion of the Prophet وسلم, and accepted to get back to the place where he came from, said, why shouldn't I do a slight service for Islam, whatever it might be? Then he said, okay, let me go to their revenue where they get together. And let me say the word of La ilaha illallah to those people who cannot tolerate it. Then he comes to a place where Quraysh people gather together. And he says, with his loud voice, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever they heard that word, they could not bother it. It did hurt them because they knew that this word aims, among other things, at getting rid of what they have inherited from their forefathers. They can no longer be plavists. They can no longer be mushrikeen or kuffar. That they have to follow and join the new faith. According to them, it's a new faith, but it's not a new faith. It has, ever, it has been there ever since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world. And now, whenever they heard that, they beat him up and dragged him down on the ground. Had it not been that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the assistant of Allah, and after that, that of Al-Abbas, he would have died at that very moment. But Al-Abbas, 
who was intelligent enough, talked to them in a way they could understand it. He said, oh Quraysh, don't you know that this man is from al Ghafar? And your commercial caravans go on that route. So if you kill him now, so how are you going to be safe when you trade in your commercial activities? That is the time when they held back and, said, and let him go. But Abu Dhar al-Ghafari did not stop at that stage. He said, I should do that again to test the same pain that I did test for the sake of Allah. Then he came back and he did the same thing and the same thing was done to him. So he did that three times and all the times and all the time, all the attempts he made, Alhamdulillah, there was a prevention on the part of Al-Abbas ibn Al -Abbas ibn Talib who saved him after Allah's help subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was some sort of sacrifice which the companions were taught and educated. This is the way how they were educated. Another thing before we come down to the way they changed the world, we need to understand how they changed it. The second thing is that whenever they did something, they did it in a way that pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perfection, al-ihsan. There was some sort of quality in it. Any kind of a deed, there was a quality in it. They, never, they were never concerned about the quantity, but they were concerned about the quality. And this is what it is. If I pray, I pray in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed me to pray. The way we have been taught by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's not that the person prays in the way or how he wants. So this kind of, of holding up to the quality or having a quality in each and every action that's being done or offered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also another thing which adds, among other things, to the fact that those people were real servants in this deen. The companions were real servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this deen. Their life, their property, their families, their time, all they had was something that were dedicated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how they worked. Also, they were concerned about the education because for you to save the world, you need to save the world with education. What are you going to say to the people? What is that, the message you want to carry to them? Is it something that you get it from your mouth, from your mind, from your pocket? Then you just throw it like that way without having it based on rationality and, and reasoning. That is why the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, you know, uh, considered the different specialities of his companions. You want to understand more about the knowledge of inheritance? Go to that Sahabi, Zayd bin Thabi. You want to learn more about the Quran and its recitation, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, has asked each and everyone to take care of a special thing. That is why they have individually and collectively succeeded in conveying the message in the way needed. This is how they changed the world. This is how they saved the world. And this is the real salvation that is to be focused on whenever we talk about the youth that changed the world. Here, the, the fruits of that was that after generations and generations, there came Muslim scholars who have contributed immensely to this deen by contributing to establishing a real Islamic civilization in the world. In a time when Europe was in its dark age, where they didn't have any clue about what science was all about, there were Muslims, young Muslims, youth, who contributed immensely to this civilization. That's why if you just have a glance at those people or prominent figures in the Islamic history, we have got, we have got Abu Qasim al-Zahrawi, who was the father of modern surgery. Or, in other way, father of operative surgery. Ibn Nafis, the father of circulatory physiology and anatomy. Abu Abbas al-Farnas, 
father of medieval aviation. We have got Jabir al Hayyan, who was the man who founded or laid down the basics of the chemistry. You have got Ibn Khaldun, who was concerned about sociology, about history, about modern economics. His book called Al Muqaddimah is a very beautiful book. It has been translated into many different languages. And I think each and every Muslim, especially those of us who are concerned about acquisition of knowledge, they should have an access to that book. They should at least read certain chapters of it. You will come across a huge, you will come across a lot of things. You can across the real Islamic civilization that is embodied in that book or embodied in the real world. You have got Ibn Sina, who was the father of early modern medicine. You have got Ibn Abbas, I mean Ibn Abbas al-Majusi, known as al-Abbasi. He was the founder of the anatomic physiology and there is a book called Al-Kamil, or Kamal Al-Kamil li al-Tibiyya, the royal book which is called. So he has, you know, he was the first one who founded, he was the first one who founded that kind of a discipline. I think those prominent scholars, are prominent scholars, who have contributed to this civilization were the ones who changed the world. Had it not been this kind of contribution, we would have been now in a dark age. The technology that we're enjoying now, the highly sophisticated technology that we are, you know, sitting down under it to say it is something that has been invented by those people. Well, alhamd. Here, Al Khawarizmi, renowned as father of Al Jabra, is quite clear what he did. Ibn Hazm. Uh, who really had got a book called Al Milal wa Nihal, so the foundation or the basics of comparative religion is something which has been laid down in Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm, if you have a glance at this book, he tries to talk about the different doctrines and tenets of the different religious, I mean, I mean religions that, were, that exist in the past, and he tries to criticize it, saying that how, oh people, you Christians, how could you? claim that there is some sort of divinity in terms of Jesus when you're talking about. How could you say that Jesus is the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How could you say that he is a part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How could you attribute the, that type of divinity, I mean, to Jesus? This is what he tries to say. To say. So Ibn Hazm and others also, they have laid down the basics of what is called now comparative religion. Al-Farabi, the founder of Islamic, I mean, uh, uh, formal logic, you know, when we talk about logic, we remember Al-Farabi. I mean, we remember also Muhammad uh, uh, Ibn Rushd also, we remember. Also, we have got also Muhammad Al-Idrisi, father of world maps. So today it would have been difficult for you to get to the place where you want without having, I mean, um, uh, at least, you know, Tom Tom or whatever we say. So it would be difficult for you without having that GPS. And this was the basics for everything. Well, alhamdulillah, those have contributed immensely to this kind of civilization. And in order to contribute, they had to be equipped with knowledge. And the knowledge, the source of the knowledge could only be the Holy Quran and the son of the Prophet That's why if you have a glance at the Quran, Quran was not a book of history, nor was it a book of science or chemistry or you name it, any kind of a discipline. But it has given us the hint to the existence of that very type of knowledge. It is for us to go deep into it, down at the bottom of the ocean, to drive from it, to take from it, whatever it does have, the peerless of that knowledge. This is what they did. You go deep into down to the ocean and you get that knowledge. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يُقَلِّبُ اللَّهُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَرُ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ اللُّولِ الْأَبْصَارِ is Allah who alters day and night. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of day and night, are signs to those who use their mind. Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
in a state of standing, in a state of sitting, in a state of laying down on their sides. But at the end, they end up saying, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batil. Oh Allah, you have not created this for, you have not created this for nonsense. There should be a purpose behind the creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this Quranic verse points out to the fact that whenever we see any kind of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should not stand back, but we should contemplate on it. We should contemplate on it and understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did create this. In what way was it created? Could that be something which came by chance? Had it not been Allah, His power, we wouldn't have that, this, we wouldn't have this heaven, we wouldn't have this. These are the things that we need. So we need to ponder, we need to contemplate on it, we need to re reflect on it, and understand that there is a purpose of the creation of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Alam tara anna al fulka tajri fi al bahri bi ni'mati Allah yuriku min ayati. Inna fi dhalika al ayatin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even when the ship sails, on the ocean, there is something. It doesn't go by itself. There is something that moves it. So by having a glance at these different, you know, characters, different things of, of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that induces us and exhorts us and pushes us towards going deep into the research so that we at least come up with something that benefits us and benefits the ummah. This is how it worked. Those are the guys who have changed the world. In to change the world, they have changed themselves. To change the world, they have changed their families. To change the world, they have changed their societies. After that, they came to the rest of the world. That is why when we talk about the change, it's not that I say, okay, I should move this thing from the place where it is now to another place. It doesn't mean like this. It does have its quality. It should have its quality. It should have its, uh, let us say, dedication. It should have everything that beautifies it. Without that, we cannot call that a change. There are people who change, but to what, to what, to what way? They change to nothing. For, by taking the people from the realm of the light to the realm of darkness, by deviating people, by getting them astray from the right path, by taking them to the hellfire. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, Duaat ala ababi jahannam, there are people, callers, at the doors of the hellfire. They call you to fall into the hellfire. So those people are now carrying flags and banners and telling the people that they are changing. And whenever they are told, you're not changers, you are corruptors, then they say, Inna nahnu muslihun, we are reformers. So under the name of reformation, many things have been corrupted. Justice has been corrupted. Harmony of the society has been corrupted. The coexistence of societies have been, I mean, has been corrected, have been corrupt. Everything has been changed. This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to positively contribute, positively add a new thing to this world. If you do not add anything new to this world, then you should at least keep silent and keep far away from it. That is why I always like to refer to a statement made by a Rafi in his book called Wahi al Qalam. He said, if you are not adding anything new to this world, then you are burdening it. It's not that we just, you know, go on routines where we sleep and wake up and eat and, and, and do nothing at all. The youth should not be concerned about what they dress. They should not be concerned about what they eat. They should not be concerned only about what they drink, but they should be concerned about bring about a new thing to this world. The same way as it has been contributed by our forefathers, the same way as it was contributed by the uh, companions of the Prophet the same way as we, be, we have been instructed by the Quran, we should add new things to this world. If you are repeating the same thing and you're just a consumer, but not a person with that kind of, of, of creativity, 
then you are not doing anything and you are not worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way needed. So the Quranic verse that says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ uh, the creation of the jinn and the mankind is just for the soul worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word worship does have a broader sense than the one that we understand it. It's not something which is confined to darkness and rituals, to praying, to fasting. Not only that, but helping others, assisting others, uh, creating new things, adding something new to the technology, inventing new things. This is the kind of this is the kind of worship which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not only told us to remain in the mosques, has not only told us to just sit down and read the Quran for 24 hours. Yes, we read it, but we read it uh, in the practical manner. We read it in the practical manner also, which actually means Quran, you know, does have uh, let us say uh, Orus. Quran told us things to do. And Quran told us things not to do. So there are do's and don'ts contained in the Holy Quran. So we follow as it is. This is how we need to deal with the Holy Quran. But dealing with it in such a way when we are quite void of what Islam is, what faith is, and we don't even pay any attention to the faith, to the Islam, and we are not even concerned about it. Even if Islam is truly destroyed, even if uh, people are not, you know, uh, anymore adherent to Islam, we're not concerned about all that we're concerned about, the way we dress and what we dress, where we sit, what we eat, where we stand. Just this is what the, 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 the kind of style, you know, in which the youth are not leaving, which is something quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, very far from the way that has been uh, you know, it prescribed to us by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, وَبِيَدِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَسِيلَةً كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ let, of, let one of you die without doing something. Even if it is the last minute of your life, if you are the last breath that is coming out from you, if you could, if you are capable of doing something, do it. Even if you just give a cup of water, to a person who's thirsty, that is something nice. But forwarding to him something to eat is something nice. Don't be concerned about yourself. Don't be particular about yourself. Be concerned about the rest of the world. This is the way we can change the world, be it subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the Quranic verses, which are available in the Holy Quran, which if I just have, if you just could say, could be more than, you know, uh, hundreds of, of Quranic verses, they have guided us to the path of research, of acquisition of knowledge, of adding something new to the world, of contributing to the civilization. This is how it is. Okay, it has been built by great people who have passed away and now we're mentioning them with good. Wallahi alhamd. If you and I are not capable of at least joining that caravan, if we cannot keep up with that cavalcade of, I mean, of the civilization, let us at least not destroy it. Not destroy it by our laziness, by our lack of faith, by our corruption, by our ma'asiyah, by our fornication. And that is what you find it within the community of the youth, if, as it were. When you find 18 years old who doesn't know anything about what Islam is. And even if you ask him a question, we'll tell you that, okay, there was a guy called Khawarizmi who one day did that for Islam. Okay, he did it. That is what he did it. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. Tilka umma qad khalat laha ma kasabat. It has already gone. And let bygones be bygones. Laha ma kasabat wa alaha ma ktasabat. So it is that nation, that nation will get what it has soon and they're going to read it there in the in the hereafter, after in the hereafter but what you did you add to islam what is your role what is your role as a youth these are the questions that we have in our mind and we need to find answers for that let me uh conclude uh, this speech with certain points which are uh, quite important when it comes to the uh, uh the contributions made by the muslims here uh 
what I have come across was that in year 1859, a young princess named Fatima Al-Fihri is said to have founded the first degree granting university in Morocco. The first degree granting university in a time when that was not available in Europe. In optics, Ibn al-Haytham, he did also add a new thing into that well. Come to the, the Quran, to the hospitals and all the things were not available in Europe when the Muslims have contributed a message to that aspect. Here, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that beautiful contribution of our brothers and sisters in the past. And we, those who are the current generation, should go forward should move forward. We should push ourselves. We are sitting now. We're not doing anything at all. Let us change the world in the same way as it was changed by them. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then that makes us uh, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will get pleased with us. Innahu jawadun barra'ufur rahim. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.